Hello. Today we will be going over a basic introduction of learning how to conduct whole cell patch clamp electrophysiology. This tutorial is broken into several parts and will include a brief introduction and then sections on solution prep, slice prep, rig setup, finding a cell, the giga seal, breaking in, and then a summary, acknowledgements, and source section. The process of patch clamping can be performed using something referred to as the voltage clamp technique. In this case, the voltage across the cell membrane is controlled by the experimenter and the resulting currents are recorded. In this tutorial, we will illustrate a whole cell patch clamp recording. Whole cell recordings involve recording currents through multiple channels simultaneously over the membrane of the entire cell. The glass recording electrode is left in place on the cell, as in cell attached recordings, but more suction is actually applied to rupture something known as the gigaohm membrane patch, thus providing access from the interior of the pipette to the intracellular space of the cell. The first step in any electrophysiological experiment is the solution prep. In our laboratory, we have a designated electrophysiology aisle where you will find all of the components required, including a scale, a stir plate, and all of the chemicals. Here, we will prepare different solutions that will be used through the entirety of the experiment. The first two solutions we will make are regular artificial cerebrospinal fluid, or ACSF for short, and also sucrose ACSF. Artificial cerebrospinal fluid has multiple functions, including it acting as a buffer solution used to immerse the hippocampal slices, to supply oxygen via carbogen, which is made up of 95% oxygen and 5% carbon dioxide. It is used to maintain osmolarity and to buffer pH at biological levels between 7.3 and 7.4. ACSF is most commonly used for electrophysiology experiments to maintain the health and viability of the neurons that are being studied. The main components of ACSF include salts containing the ions vital to proper slice health and maintaining cell homeostasis. With sucrose ACSF, swapping sodium chloride, NaCl, with sucrose provides a notable improvement in neuronal preservation, and this is the primary reason why sucrose ACSF is used for the cutting solution. Additionally, sucrose ACSF also includes sodium pyruvate, which is a salt of pyruvic acid and is commonly used to be added to cell culture media as an additional source of energy, but also has been shown to have protective effects against hydrogen peroxide. Additionally, L-ascorbic acid, also referred to as vitamin C, is an essential nutrient involved in the repair of tissue and the enzymatic production of certain neurotransmitters. Lastly, we will also prepare an intracellular pipette solution. This will contain cesium, which is a potassium channel blocker when used in an internal solution. This is due to cesium having a larger ion size than potassium, so that it doesn't allow potassium to move through its pore. Due to this, when you use cesium in whole cell experiments, you'll have an increasing block of potassium channels that will depolarize your cell. The use of cesium in internal solutions is often used for studying excitatory postsynaptic currents. Additionally, we will also use EGTA, which is a specific chelator for calcium used as a buffering agent. We will include HEPES, which is a buffering agent for the pH. We will include three energy sources, which function to keep cell processes functioning. And we will also include QX314 bromide, which blocks inactivating sodium channels at low concentrations of about 0.5 millimolars, uh, but also blocks calcium channels uh, 
when approaching around the 10 millimolar mark. And lastly, we will also include picrotoxin, which is used to block fast inhibitory GABA-A channels. After making the solutions, it is important to ensure that the pH of the ACSF falls within the range of 7.3 to 7.4, and also that the osmolarity of the ACSF is approximately 10 milliosmols higher than that of the internal solution. So in this case, our ACSF tested at an osmolarity of 293 milliosmoles, and our internal solution was tested after and found to be 283 milliosmoles. Having the internal solution at a lower osmolarity allows for lower access resistance, which prevents the chances of the membrane resealing. Next, we prepare for slicing. Here, we set up the solution with the tools required for the extraction and dissection of the brain in hippocampus. We prepare ice-chilled carbogen bubbling ACSF at about 2 to 4 degrees Celsius for the brain to rest in while we perform the dissection and slicing. In order to prepare the brain for slicing, we first need to extract the brain. To do this, we make an incision along the longitudinal fissure of the skull, and then pull back the pieces of the skull and meninges lying underneath. We then carefully extract the brain and place it into bubbling carbogen ACSF. We prepare the tissue for slicing by first removing the cerebellum, followed by the prefrontal cortex. We then split each hemisphere along the midline with a longitudinal cut. The hemispheres are then rotated to their mid-sagittal side, and a section of the tissue is removed from the dorsal cerebrum at an approximate angle of roughly 30 degrees relative to the base cutting surface and 5 to 12 or 15 degrees along the rostral caudal axis. We then transfer each cerebral hemisphere to a dry piece of filter paper before putting the cut dorsal surface onto the glue of the chuck. We are very careful to ensure that the hemisphere is placed onto that cut side so that it isn't knocked out of orientation. We then allow the glue to aerate and dry and place it into the chamber of the vibratome. We carefully take 400 micron slices and move them gently into the incubation chamber where they will stay for approximately 45 minutes to an hour prior to use, being used for electrophysiology experiments. Bubbling carbogen is applied to the slices throughout the entire incubation process. Additionally, the slices first are incubated at approximately 32 degrees Celsius, and then the temperature is slowly reduced to room temperature over the course of that hour-long incubation process. For setting up the rig, we first apply the ACSF and allow this to run through the entire rig. We bubble the ACSF with carbogen and adjust the flow rate of the ACSF solution to approximately 2 to 3 milliliters per minute. We also turn on all of the hardware, including the pumps, stim box, AxoPatch 200B or multi-clamp, amplifiers, and the heat temperature boxes, which are set to 32 degrees Celsius, plus or minus one degree. Additionally, we also turn on the multi-clamp and clamp fit software used to track live data and used for the data analysis. We will then prepare a pipette filler for the intracellular solution. We have a syringe, a filter, and a pipette tip. We create an open flame and then use the pipette tip to stretch its length 
such that we can create a very fine diameter of the tip. Once the tip has cooled, we can then cut off the excess part of the tip, ensuring that the tip is still long enough so that it can reach the bottom of the glass recording pipettes. We then can assemble the entire pipette filler and fill it with the intracellular solution that will be used for our recordings. We then can fabricate a glass recording pipette by using appropriate glass capillaries in a pipette puller. For the sake of whole cell recordings, we should be programming the pipettes to pull a diameter such that the tip resistance is within 3 to 8 mega ohms. Here is an example of those pipette tips. We then can fill the pipettes with the intracellular solution, carefully ensuring that no air bubbles are created in the process. And if they are, we can use a flicking motion to get rid of them. We then can place the recording pipette onto the electrode holder of the patch clamp amplifier head stage and fasten it securely. We then can carefully place a brain slice into the recording chamber and secure the slice using a weight, moving it around with a small paintbrush. Once the slice is placed, we can use the 5 times objective lens to look at the dentate gyrus region, as shown, the cornua monis region, and lastly the cortex. We can choose any one of these areas for our whole cell patch clamp recordings. In this video, we will focus in on the cortex pyramidal cells. Once we have found our desired region of recording, we are then ready to start looking for cells. To do this, we will switch from the 5 times objective lens to the 40 times objective lens. We will carefully bring the lens down such that it will make contact with the surface of the bath solution. We then ever so slightly bring the lens up again, allowing room for the electrodes to move in and touch the tissue. Again, here is another example of Scott moving the reference electrode in place in the dentate gyrus region during another recording, and then switching to the 40 times lens. Notice how the level of magnification is different, and how we switch from general regionalization to actually being able to see distinct cells. Next, we must choose a cell. Generally, viable cells will be lightly outlined with a somewhat circular shape, as seen on the right. Training one's eye to identify healthy neurons, or rather patchable neurons, takes experience and varies from area to area. Usually neurons located deeper in the slice tend to be better for patch purposes, since they have been less exposed to the cutting surface and the environment surrounding the surface of the tissue. Using the micromanipulator at medium speed, descend the recording pipette to the region of interest. Then, switch to slow and bring the recording pipette down towards the surface of the desired neuron, switching between the focus of the cell and the tip. Once your pipette tip is close enough, you may notice a slight dimple forming on the surface of the membranes of the cell. This is due to the positive pressure of the pipette tip. Once our recording pipette is in close proximity to the cell, we are ready to form our gigaohm seal. To have a better understanding of this process, let's look at an example. Before putting the pipette in the bath and tissue, we are in the search mode, and a slight positive pressure is maintained in the pipette tip to prevent debris from entering. Once a viable cell has been located, 
and we are bringing our pipette tip into contact with the cell membrane, we then can apply a slight negative pressure at the tip to create what is known as the gigaohm seal. The gigaohm is denoted because the tip resistance will dramatically increase to one gigaohm, and simultaneously, when the seal is formed, the amount of electrical current passing through the pipette tip is dramatically reduced, as can be noticed on the live data software. At this stage, this is regarded to as the cell attached patch clamp configuration. You may be wondering what the figure on the right represents. This is when we will be in whole cell patch clamp recording mode. This will be discussed in a further section. But what's interesting to note is that the gigaohm seal, as seen in the middle figure, will actually be broken, and again, the recording pipette will become an extension of the neuron's membrane. What we see in this picture is an example of the tip resistance and current response when the glass recording pipette is in the bath solution prior to patching. We see a resistance of 1.9 megaohms and a large square current pulse. What might this suggest? Well, typically, for whole cell patch clamp recordings, we actually want to use pipette tips with a resistance of 3 to 8 megaohms, as mentioned earlier. This means that we want our tips with a slightly smaller diameter, and this can be configured on the pipette pulling machine. With a higher tip resistance, less current can flow through the tip, and thus a smaller current pulse will be noticed. Once we have adequate pipette tips, and we bring the pipette tip into contact with the cell membrane, we can see that the tip resistance increases to roughly 200 megaohms. By then applying a slight negative pressure, we can create the gigaohm seal with yet an even higher tip resistance. This is because the gap between the membrane and the tip is minimized. As with the gigaohm seal, we will see this square pulse of current greatly diminished, even further. And this is because less current can pass through the tip of the recording electrode. Once a stable gigaohm seal is formed, denoted by the tip resistance being maintained over one gigaohm, we are then ready to perform a whole cell patch. We then, once again, apply a slight negative pressure to rupture the cell membrane, allowing the glass recording pipette to, therefore, become an extension of the membrane. This is regarded to as the whole cell patch clamp configuration. It can be noticed that there is a change in current charging the membrane because of the cell capacitance. Since the membrane of the cell acts as a capacitor, when the glass pipette has gained access to the intracellular space, the current responses to the seal test should show an exponential decay. In our voltage clamp experiments here, we will hold the membrane at negative 60 millivolts. Additionally, once we've broken into the cell, we can switch our membrane test to the cell mode and record the baseline parameters as seen on the screen. This includes the membrane capacitance, the membrane resistance, the access resistance, as was mentioned earlier, indicating the lower the better, typically, uh, with a range of less than 40 mega ohms being satisfactory and less than 30 mega ohms being considered good. Also, we can record the tau, which is also referred to as the decay time. If we are satisfied with these baseline parameters, we can then run an IV curve. Notice that as this IV curve is running, we'll start to see small, miniature, excitatory postsynaptic currents occurring. 